Right, guys, I'm sure you're all keen to get started. Um, that bing bing is people arriving onto the call, just in case you're wondering. I usually settle down after a few minutes in the call. Just uh, to give you a heads up before we officially fully start, um, Michael is recording this just for people who can't make it and for future days. If you have any problems with that, um, give us give us a heads up, um, or certainly don't <laughs> don't have your um, camera on if any employers don't want to see you on the call, etc., which has happened. Um, but uh, we'll get cracking now in about 30 seconds. Uh, just before we start as well, don't be shy. If you have any questions, unmute the mic and ask them. And um, any technical problems, just anything really bad, like the screen freezes, we find if you minimize and maximize it again, worst case scenario, log out, log back in. Um, and it's we're getting recorded anyway, so you won't miss the whole lot or just email me at the end. Um, so we'll get cracking here. Michael also, clearly he's on the call. So any hurling questions you can ask him. Is that fair enough, Mike? Michael? <laughs> he's, he's gone shy. First time for everything. Okay. So I'm going to get cracking. Just that's the housekeeping going there. Um, so why are we here today? Just to recap, um, this is a sort of follow-on from the last talk. But uh, I tried to make it a standalone talk as well. So what I'm trying to talk about today is uh, well, is modern fitness training. Um, I'll probably admit freely that that was a sort of, um, to get a few people on the call, um, nothing's new in, in strength and conditioning or fitness training, really. I mean, um, you, if you can go back to the times of the Greeks and they were doing push-ups and throwing med balls. But um, I suppose modern in the sense that more modern in our thought process. Um, it's a big, big topic, a big, big area, but then again, it isn't. It's a sort of, it's sort of a weird one, and it's usually the one with most sort of uh, confusion for everyone, uh, coaches, players, everyone. Um, I will say this, I'm going to start talking about these three or four things that I recommend. That doesn't mean that's the, 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 the end of it, or that doesn't mean that I have all the answers. That's far from the truth. Um, but hopefully it takes something from it. And I've tried to make the science um, as understandable as possible. And so I probably omitted one or two things that maybe one or two years in the call are like, why has he left that out? Um, so that's probably the reason. Um, but if you do have any uh, questions, you can either type them in the box or just unmute the mic, as I say, and ask away. OK, and um, so before we will just go into I don't know why my things are driving on. Um, just a few key principles before we start, and I might go over these again. Um, I firmly believe in the minimal effective dose. So just to get technical for a minute, when we're talking about fitness training, uh, it's sort of like a drug. It kind of is, really. So you're basically putting a team through X to hopefully elicit Y. So one of my key beliefs is if 10 runs, if you want to say something as mundane as that work, why do 20? If 10 work, why do 20? It doesn't make any sense when you think about it. Now, you might say, well, I want the mentally tough and I want this and I want that. That's fair enough. Um, and I would probably say there's a time and place for that. But um, just generally speaking, always go by the minimal effective dose. Um, doctors do that all the time. I don't see why as coaches we shouldn't do the same. 10% rule is something that mm, I'll give credit to Tim Gabbett for, uh, a researcher in the area meaning don't increase volume by more than 10% each week. And we kind of all know that. So I take Michael Cleary. He's playing hurling. I'm training him. And he did 20 runs on the Monday. Well, the following Monday, I shouldn't do 40 because that's too big of a jump. And um, you might find that the start of training, uh, maybe you went too easy on, on people and, you know, you might have to break that rule. But all things being told, um, going over the 10% rule and distance or intensity seems to bite you uh, in the bum later on. And um, there is exceptions, of course, like there is for everything, but it's a nice principle to, uh, before we, 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 we um, delve into it deeper, um, it's a nice principle just to start off with. Um, you should really build in easier weeks in your cycle. Um, I think we kind of do that anyway. I will say as well, the nature of the GAA is the, the rest and the recovery generally looks after itself on that front. 
Um, but things that you need to look out for are, and it's not always possible, but it's like the player that's on six different teams. That sort of age bracket that we all know is a disaster. Um, soccer, hurling, rugby, everything else in between. You can only do your best um, and just be aware of it. And I think you, there's lots and lots of technology out there about how to fix that. But at the end of the day, a good coach's eye, player walks in, he's, he, he or she is either limping or has mucky knees from a match they played at lunchtime. Just keep an eye out for that. So, um, but in your plan with a team, all things being equal, you're in complete control of, of said team. Every four or five weeks, you should make that training easier. Um, and we'll briefly talk about that. And I don't know if anyone was on the call the last day. Remember the Russian pencil analogy. If I was to put up and show you what is out there for conditioning um, and, and, and the Excel charts and the templates and the absolute genius work uh, done by, say, Mladen, uh, can he pronounce his surname? Mladen Jovanovic, he's a Serbian or uh, there's loads of them um, out there. It would just scare you. And it scares me. Um, but remember, in the GAA especially, it has to be that Russian pencil. And if um, in the space race, if no one gets that analogy. Um, I, uh, <laughs> look, Google and the Russian space race pen, and uh, that would become clear to you. So what are we trying to do when we train at all? Um, well, it's kind of like kind of this very sophisticated looking chart that I drew on Word. But um, basically, you know, you have, uh, that's it. Everyone has the same hardware. So a marathon runner and a Gaelic footballer or hurler has the same hardware. So you have, if you look at the bottom of that chart, you have, uh, you have 10 seconds, meaning powerful bursts. So, you know, uh, Michael Cleary's running to that slitter before I am. That's what he needs in energy to do that. And also, if Michael was to say to take up marathons, he'd need an energy system that would enable him to keep going for two to three hours or a cycle, et cetera, et cetera. And everything in between is sort of what we're training. And um, the line across the middle is sort of that middle of the road where we switch from one type to the other um, or, or a fancy term called anaerobic threshold. Now, just from your own head there, where do we think Gaelic uh, footballers and hurlers reside? Well, I would argue they probably need a little bit of everything. I think most people on the call would probably agree. Certainly, we don't need them to go for four hours nonstop. Um, but we need them to have enough endurance that they can play the season uh, nonstop um, and push that anaero uh, anaerobic threshold up. Um, so basically, what we, we push that curve. So if you see the curve on the right, we've made that engine more efficient and more conditioned. So that would mean... In other words, if you see those hard lines, um, we need to train uh, for 10 second bursts. We need to make sure the player can last for the full game and for the And we probably need to make sure they have a tiny little bit of the really like insurance stuff. Um, but it's less, less, lesser of consideration, but it's still in the back of our mind. You will see players now and again who just don't have an engine so you might prescribe to him or her go out on a bike for for three hours <laughs> uh join a cycling club build an engine come back to me i know that's a silly one but it, it has been known to happen throughout the years so just something to think about we're actually just training a metabolic energy system and if uh if anyone has their mic unmuted if they could be so kind just to mute it there and um, just makes the audio sound a little bit better thanks very much um so what are we going to have to do to um, to, to do all this? Um, fitness testing. So it's important. I will say this. I don't think it's as important at underage level, really near as much as, say, senior level. And this is more towards the underage level. But I still think it's a nice thing to do if the fitness test informs decisions going forward. So if the fitness test is just for the crack or if it's just a way to punish your team or if it's, I don't think it has a whole lot of benefit. I like to prescribe fitness tests that um, I can get some data out of. Go back to the analogy of the space race again. I want the, it to be a Russian space pen where it's actually simple to do. 
So, for example, um, most people here might have heard of the bleep test. And I like the bleep test, and it does what it says on the tin. Or the yo-yo test is another good fitness test. And they are good fitness tests, and they will give you data. But I find in the GA setting, it's kind of simple. Simply, um, you need a, a very uh, large ghetto blaster, if you remember what ghetto blasters were, uh, people my age on the call, or certainly a large sound system. Um, it just can be a bit tricky to mark. You have to educate the players on how to correct it. It's not impossible. It just can be a little bit of a barrier to be done often. And if it's a hardship that you need to book a hall, for example, to do a fitness test, really honestly appraise yourself as Gaelic coaches on the ground. Is it really that realistic? And, um, you know, do you have to pay the 30, 40 euro just to book the hall just to do a fitness test that um, you might do twice in the year? So I like to do stuff that I can do nearly any fitness session, any training session. And, might, and scientists might jump on the call and say, well, that's not as, as viable as this or that or the Bronco or the spider test um, or any other test. And that's absolutely 100 percent. But this is just what I find from maybe 15, 16 years coaching teams at this stage. Um, and if I'm with a senior in the county team or something like that, I, it, it's different. But um it's just, it's just something to be aware of. And we'll go through that today. I do think as well, if everyone closes their eyes and think of fitness tests they did as a kids, did we ever get feedback on them? Did we ever get a piece of paper to say, you are missing X, Y, Z, you need to work on X, Y, Z. And um, that's the ultimate challenge. And it's hard to do because you might have 35 kids or 35 players staring at you. And you might be overwhelmed in your own professional job uh, but it's, the, it's it's probably vastly better to do it that way than just do it for the crack, yeah? Um, players nowadays as well are, are obviously on the internet and they're a bit more up to date at all ages. And it's nice that you're showing them that you're a bit more scientific in your approach. Um, and um, it's just a good thing to do. You know, you know where you have to go. It builds a bit of a culture in your squad. Um, but don't bog down on it. Don't be overly, you know, hung up on it, especially at underage level. I'll give you a story from my own coaching career. Um, I was once upon a time coaching the Monaghan senior footballers that were based in Dublin. And phenomenally fit lads, as you'd imagine, they were flying at, at the time, Division 1 or whatever. One of the players used to do uh, a fitness test, and he was brutal at that particular fitness test. He just wasn't set up to do well in that one that Monaghan used. But in a game, if you watched it, you think he's the fittest player. So there's always little exceptions like that. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if the player can knock over a few points, you know, you'll soon forgive them. But So I'm talking at an overall level. Also, another one thing I would strongly urge you to do is never underestimate the power of fitness testing a kid, giving them a score, and then just sending them on their way. It can crush some kids. So I call it framing. So what I mean by that is you, you sit them down before you do any of this stuff and you say, I don't care if you run this in 100 minutes. This is just to inform me and you down the line and give them stories about people that, you know, worked and worked and got to the level they needed and make it a positive thing and stamp out anyone in the squad using an opportunity to bully. And um, so just be careful. That's why um, now when they get older and we're trying to win big championship matches, I'm going to put them fitness tests up on the on the on the uh, dressing room wall. That, 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 that you know the nurturing part has probably left the building. But certainly at underage level, uh, I don't really care. Uh, games are where it's at, but it's still nice to do it right. And um, so that's sort of a few little caveats there, um, and where and how to work around them. So one of the fitness tests I'm going to go through today would be the one kilometer time trial. A um, bit of a controversial one, uh, because like everything in the fitness industry, things become trendy, untrendy, and the copycat phenomenon. Um, but I will say you could easily uh, turn this into a 1.2 kilometer time trial or a 1.5 kilometer time trial. But I just like the one kilometer time trial for no other reason. I've been doing it so long. I have a big bank of data. So if a player runs, uh, if Michael Cleary runs, in 200 seconds, I know exactly where he's at in relation to other people. 
Um, I do think for underage teams, you could even do this, or you know, really young teams. Um, I wouldn't bother doing any real fitness testing, obviously, with a really young team, but maybe like say a 15 year old team where you just want to give them a little bit of a window into it and see where they're at and maybe encourage them to take their fitness a bit more seriously. You could certainly do an 800 meter time trial, and I'll show you how you could do that as well. I just like the 1K. I always wanted it in the county to be a sort of spiritual thing where who got which time and the hurlers playing it up against the footballers and have a bit of fun with it. Um, so some of the blurbs there is you just need to measure 100 metres and players run up and back. Uh, so And that's a big, big one for me. I'm not a big fan of the one in the straight line. Um, I like a few little twists and turns in it just to make it a little bit more specific. But if you like doing it in the straight line, there is equations out there that will... Uh, convert that into shuttle type one but I wouldn't worry about that all you need to do is pair players off and all you need to run this test uh, folks is a trundle wheel uh, cones and a ton of pens and paper and if in theory if you have 100 kids you could do uh, 50 kids doing it and then 50 kids correcting and swap now good luck doing it with 100 kids um, and your voice will fall off but in theory you could do it with 100 kids and that's why uh, I love it for um, on the ground, awfully stuff, I have to say. Um, and so this is just more specifics of it. So here you have uh, the player at the yellow cone is waiting to run. The player obviously in the middle is doing the run. And you just need, you could have 50 lines of that. So you could have, um, well, you know, within reason, obviously, maybe, I think the most we've done is 20 kids running, 20 kids, correct? And maybe slightly higher um, and uh, you see the, the the coach emoji or whatever they're called nowadays with the watch and the megaphone all that coach needs to do is roar the times out as the players run back so I tend to take the splits which basically means this player runs from the yellow cone to the purple cone and then from the purple cone to the yellow and that's 200 meters obviously and that we get a time you don't have to do that. I don't know why I like doing it, but I do like doing it, just in case the player uh, steps out or it shows up players who maybe have gaps in their energy system in terms of they just pace themselves terribly wrong and different things like that. But you can definitely just do it uh, with, the, with the finish time. Um, and obviously at the purple cone there, I strongly recommend you'd have another coach making sure the players actually hit the cone. Uh, one thing I strongly recommend in your clubs also is, rather than having to tr trundle out the trundle wheel every time, mark it once really accurately. Um, you can get these things that screw into uh, grass, and you know you can even mow over them and stuff. I'll, I'll, I couldn't find the name of them, but I have them somewhere, and I can dig it out for the people on the call. And Or even we used in the FINA Gar Club, we used to use... Um, we had a, a fence and we painted it where the 1K was and we just, just anything that's consistent. So even if you make a mistake with that 100 metres, well, it's your 100 metres <laughs> and your, your, your team are running it on the same, uh, at least on the same distance each time. Like all these tests, they technically should be ran on AstroTurf or at least indoors. But, you know, that's a luxury maybe most um, people mightn't have. So um, just something to be aware of. Does anyone have any questions on that before I drive on? You're all very studious. The tumbleweed there, no, not so fair. <laughs> no. um, so this is something I'll make available to you after the call as well. Um, I love these cards. Just, and I'll tell you why, just looks professional for starters. Uh, we actually printed them on heavy enough card um, it's a it's a bit of a nightmare trying to keep track of them and hand them to teams and stuff. But sure, um, but at a club level, um, you could just make your own and just do it on Word. But we got them kind of jazzed up a little bit. And the reason I like it is because players forget what they scored the last time very quickly. Some don't, some do. And so if a player stares at a one k and finish time and it says, uh four minutes okay and um, well then they know they have to break four minutes <laughs> and i know that sounds silly 
but, but it, it it just it just does help. Um, and you know when they're when they're hearing from a pacing point of view that when they did uh, uh, four minutes the first time they did the test, they were X time. They know they have to haul it a bit faster and stuff like that. And um, also you need to be aware of every fitness test in the known universe. You'll get better at it just by doing it. And that is one of the problems with fitness testing is um, there was a story in uh, when the when the when Britain uh, ruled India and they wanted to eradicate snakes from India. So they said to the locals, if you kill any snakes, we'll then um, give you money per snake. So what did the Indians do? They started breeding snakes and they obviously then killing them and handing them up and getting money and snake population never went down. So in other words, when the measure becomes the goal, the test can become corrupted. So, but that's by the by. If a player is running this in a good time, you know, they're fit. I mean, move on. So it's sort of just something to think about. And make sure you have some system in place to collect this data and input it. I recommend Google Sheets because it's free and because, you know, you won't ever lose it or you change computers and it doesn't go missing and you can make... Uh, your players access it and it's just about going on YouTube and figuring out how to use these things um, when you have a chance now All right, Dave. go ahead question came in there um, in regards to testing how often should we, be, should we be looking at doing this gaps between each yeah so um, fitness test I don't know use your common sense I'd say every five six weeks or four weeks so you want to actually, and like, there's no point fitness testing, for example, um, when you're not actually doing a whole lot of fitness stuff in between. Because, well, I suppose there is a point you could show detraining. But just you apply common sense. The 1K test as well, when players get used to it, you can run that off and go back to games and drill straight away after, after a bit of water and a bit of stretching. Um, the first few times you do it, all right, it'll be a shock to the player system. But I would say, um, as another thing as well, guys, when uh, this is kind of off topic, but on topic of the question, is you want to make sure that white coat fever is a huge thing in these tests as well. You just get some kids who invent injuries or um, just kind of get a bit worked up, you know, like um, it's called white coat fever. But obviously, the more you do it, um, the more that goes away. And also... A lot of players are conditioned that if they avoid one fitness test and certainly two, well, then that they usually go away because the coach forgets. So I would recommend for no other reason, I would just have this if I was training, a, say, an under-16 team. I would do this every four or five weeks. Um, and maybe in the height of, the, of a championship, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even look at it, you know. But certainly when we're in a training mode, um, just to see we're going in the right direction. Um, that's what I would do. Does that make answer the question? Whoever answer, asked it. Yeah or nay? <laughs> tough crowd, tough crowd. Enough, yeah. Yeah. No Thanks. No problem. Um, and if there's any more questions, because this is kind of heavy stuff, so just, just ask them. Type them in the box if you're too shy. So um, now this is probably the heaviest slide I'll ever do with um, with uh, one of these webinars. So I'm just going to take me time and just explain this to you. So remember I said earlier, why would you bother doing a fitness test um, like uh, a really uh, you know tough one to administer? If it doesn't really give you any data that you can work off, you know, um, why do it? Um, that's why I love the 1K. It has many, many faults, like everything, but it does give you data that you can use. And especially with beginner athletes, it's pretty useful data. So um, this is the data you can use with it, okay? And this looks a bit daunting, but I'll explain it and we'll do a few examples on the call here now. So... An example of, let's say, uh, I think Nigel Bracken, are you on the call? I think I saw your name. So Nigel Bracken ran the 1K in three minutes and 20 seconds, which, by the way, is shifting. OK, it's good time, you would say. Um, and so that's 200 seconds. So that's boom. OK, that's simple. 
next slide or next uh, bullet point. So we take the distance Nigel traveled, which was a thousand meters on the 1K. And if you were did the 1.2K and you prefer that, you would just say 1,200 meters. But I'm going to make it really simple and say a thousand, obviously, because I prefer the 1K anyway. And we divide that by 200. So distance over time equals five meters per second. Or simply put, the number five. So what do we do with that number five? So what we said is, Nigel's um, mass, if you want to say it like that, is five meters per second. Okay. Now, so that's 100%. So we then take that number five and we multiply that by 120. Now, the reason we multiply that, or uh, 120%, should I say, the reason we multiply that is because the Eurofit method, which I'm about to teach you, tells you that you want to be training athletes at about 110. 120, or in some rare cases, 130% of what their 100% is, if that makes any sense. So we take the number five and we multiply that by 120%, and that comes out nice and even actually at six. So that's six meters per second. So now, again, this is the French research called the Eurofit method. And it's sometimes, and I'm as bad as everyone. Uh, uh, it's sometimes mistakenly called mass runs, which actually, technically speaking, is incorrect. But listen, we won't lose sleep over it. Now, the Eurofit method tells us we want to work our athletes at 120% of their ability in a 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off format. Now, why they did that, you can look up the research papers on this and actually, the one that's famous is by a gentleman called Dan Baker. And if you type in Dan Baker, M-A-S, it's actually quite readable. And he gives you way more info on this. Um, so that's 15 on. So we take the number six and we multiply that by 15 seconds. And that gives us 90 meters. This means that Jimmy will be running 90 meters when we prescribe running for him in our conditioning program of 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off. And let's say we do this for five minutes. And there you've, you've sort of um, got yourself going with how to use the data. Now, that looks a little bit complicated, but I trust you. If you just, um, like anything, in ma I'm brutal at maths, by the way, um, you can Google, there's mass calculators that will do this for you. So all you'd have to do is put in the distance of the run, et cetera, et cetera. But I like to know what's behind it to understand it. And remember, where is he pulling 15 from? Well, I'm pulling 15 from the Eurofit method uh, of conditioning players, basically it's called. Some very robust study by French researchers. Um, like every fitness program or fitness modality, it has holes in the bucket. And we'll, we'll talk about them in a minute. But uh, I just want everyone to uh, look at that and let that marinate for a couple of seconds. So now let's take another example, um, because you, you certainly won't be seeing many three minutes and 20 seconds uh, times with an underage team, for example. So let's say Sandra does the test in four minutes. Same test right beside Jimmy there who did it before. Well, that's now 240 seconds. 1,000 meters divided by 244.16. 4.16 by 120%. That's nearly five. And then five by 15 equals 75 meter shuttles. So now here's the, the beauty of this, shall we say. Uh, the beauty of all this is that Jimmy is running 90 meters, which is fit. Um, but Sandra is doing 75 meters, which is needs a bit of work. I'm um, sorry, uh, and, but that's fine too. But it's relevant to them. And that's pretty, pretty powerful. Um, so and if I go to the next slide here, that's sort of how it will kind of operationalize, as they say in science, on the ground. So you might have there's a, a, a four distinct groups in your team, and that's how you would do the open backs uh, with them. Now, where's the holes in the bucket in this method? It kind of rewards this, this, the least fit player with the smallest run, which can be an issue. And it also sort of penalizes the fitter player and they have to do longer runs. Again, 
every tool has a little problem. The way you work around this is, and another thing is, and I'll be honest with you, uh, on the real world, I might only have, like this picture shows, four cones on the ground. There's no way in hell I'm giving every single player an individual cone. You'd be there till midnight, won't you? So a lot of the teams just do is, so let's say you take a player who Michael is well able to do 90 meter runs. Michael dosses the fitness test uh, when I did it with him. And he's now in group four there, as you can see in this slide. Well, when I watch him absolutely hammer the runs when I'm training him, I say, Michael, go up to group two. And then if he's still hitting the cone, I say group. And likewise, you could get a player that's in group one that just ran uh, the run of, of his or her life. And you might need to shift them back. And so be it. But at least it's way more specific than what we used to do, which was just do laps around the field. And some people were in the red zone dying and some people were absolutely cruising and the people in the middle were getting a good training effect. So that was kind of the beauty of Eurofit method runs and commonly called mass runs. Does anyone have any questions on that? Question came in there, there from Niall. If the fitness retest is every four to five weeks and the easy week is four to five weeks, how would you schedule each? Would you well, spread them apart or keep them close yeah, there? Yeah, well, remember, like, um, a fitness test, I wouldn't... Good question. A fitness test wouldn't be deemed massive load. They're only one in, running one kilometre. So, in theory, they could go for a light kick around, do a dynamic warm-up and do a 1K. That's your training. Now, that's, that's, I wouldn't do it like that. But uh, a down week wouldn't be an, a week off either. Um, I'll give you an example. Let's say a highly trained marathon runner. He or she might be doing oh, 90 miles a week and the rest coming up to the marathon. And an easy week for that person might be 50 miles. <laughs> but some of the intensity is still kept in there. Just the volume is dropped down. Um, or even you might train four days a week and you go three. And um, so you just you just pair it back a little bit. That's not to say that they put their feet up and play Xbox for a week for a week far from it. Does that answer that gentleman's or lady's question? Yeah, I think happy enough. There's another one come in there from Enda. What age would you start mass runs? Good question. Um, so I think that's a very good question. Um, I don't know what's the simple answer. Well, I will say this. Uh, I would say when they're emotionally mature enough to do it. And I think that's what, 12, 13? Michael, what would you say from coaching on the ground? Yeah, I'd probably say 13, 14, I'd say. Would be, yeah, yeah, I'd say so. When we develop the squads at, at 14, 15. Yeah. So would be uh, yeah. Who's got the tunes on? Turn them up. <laughs> and, Yes, sir. It's mad what pops up on the airwaves, isn't it? But um, but all joking aside, I wouldn't even be worrying about it with her, with her underage, underage, if you know what I mean. Like, uh, if I drive down to a gag club and I see an under 10 team doing mass runs, I'd be like, mm. haven't said that, though. What do they do when they join the athletics club? It's a question we all kind of, um, oh, that's a good point. Like, I want my son, who's not even three yet, to join athletics. They'll have him running, doing way more than mass runs when he joins Rohini Shamrocks. Um, obviously, that's because that's their sport, etc. But I'm just saying, I would say 13, 14 is when I'd even look at this stuff. Um, I would say if I was training 12, 13-year-olds, I'd introduce it. So I might say, lads, next year we might be doing a little bit more formal fitness stuff. We'll give this a go and maybe do a little kind of two-minute little block of it. That would be kind of, what, what would you think, Michael? Yeah, I wouldn't be going crazy. Definitely not at that age. Um, be crowned, it's just a, an introductory session, really. Get yeah. them aware of it, and then maybe a year or two down the line, they're kind of more intense sessions then after that. That's the way yeah. to go on. Yeah, and we'll talk about that as we go on as well. Um, and uh, any questions at the end, we can go back. But I know that's heavy, but, I, uh, uh, and, uh, but that's kind of a nice, if you learn that and nothing else from the call and just how to, you know, put them up on Excel and different things, uh, I think you could be... A lot better, um, you know, knowledge base on this type of stuff. So, like, basically, mass runs, I told you, it's not, they're not really mass runs. But anyway, very simple. It's just interval training. Um, 
and the distance you run depends on your 1k time so that's a nice little summary of mass runs um, and they're not to be all and end all but it's just them teaching you some modern fitness methods so then we have another form of, of training we can do it's pretty similar to mass runs except they look a lot different and they do elicit slightly different adaptation in the body these would be more endurance style runs these would be more um you know, like the you know deep in the pre-season maybe well you could do them any time but maybe just to build a bit of an engine so let's say the player just dies on the last 10 minutes and um, now the old days you know we would have sent him or her out for five six seven eight k run that still has a place by the way um but not probably optimal because you run the risk of when you do lots of 5Ks that you become a 5K runner or your body morphs into one. And that's not what we want for Gaelic games. We want their players fast, strong, agile. So that's the kind of always the sort of double-edged sword here. But tempo runs um, are kind of making a comeback, uh, even though they've been around since God knows when. But... um. Again, a 100-meter track, but you can definitely do these in a 200-meter track. Um, this would be your older ages. Um, well, yeah, you could do this with um, with some underage teams, maybe, say, like we said, the same age group again. But um, And I've written down 15, 17 seconds to complete the run. That'll be shifting. <laughs> so I should have wrote, obviously, as you get younger and, you know, legs are shorter and they're not mature that could be up to 22 23 seconds but the main thing is you're you're they're going on a rolling clock of every minute so again myself uh, and michael are lined up on on the cone we run 100 meters in the in, in the distance and the coach says to us guys you have 17 seconds to complete this run wait up there and rest um so this is a slow burner because you're giving them one part effort to maybe three parts recovery. But it just hits the players in a different way. And it's Charlie Francis kind of called these chicken soup. So they were kind of like chicken soup of conditioning. So they kind of kept your speed qualities up, but didn't savage your legs too much. But by the end of the session, you might have run two and a, this is at a senior level now. I'm just giving an example. You might have run two and a half K at a really good standard. Um, people forget about tempo runs the whole point of them is that when you do them your technique in the run is good and um, so that's another problem with doing 5k's and I'm, by the way i'm not against running the odd 5k far from it but um it's very hard to maintain really kind of like forest Cump style really good running technique as you clip along but in a tempo run that's sort of the essence of it and as you know yourself concentrating on your technique when you do anything makes it metabolically tougher if you know what i mean uh, and we build these up over time and these are quite simple to kind of progress so here's a sort of little uh, diagram of what it could look like so again 100 meter uh, track you can definitely do you know 200s here but i generally for ease just do 100 i use the same track that i would have for you know set up for me fitness test really there's what uh, i have five players running there and they're all running to the cone at their own pace in one sense um but we certainly don't want the players to sprint it otherwise the tempo has become a completely different thing so tempo runs are tricky and they take gaelic players a while because gaelic players look at you like what do you mean you want me to take my time getting up to the cone yes i do um and then they get up to the top of the cone and they wait uh, and it seems like an eternity but remember you're hitting them. They might have to do uh, day one, 10 of these. And by day 60, they might be doing 30 of these. And then come back to me and say, <laughs> tempo runs are easy. And um, they just hit you in a different way. So it's a sneaky way to get real kind of endurance training into Gaelic players' legs, if you want to say it like that. Um, you'll notice that I have a picture of a gentleman at the top doing push-ups. And you can introduce this type of stuff um, in tempo runs in the recovery period. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So it could be a simple thing. We all line up with the yellow cone. We go, we finish our run in 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22 seconds, depending on the age of the kid and blah, blah, blah. 
And then as soon as they finish the run, they walk 10 steps forward, they walk 10 steps back, and they might do 10 push-ups before they go again. And then on the yellow cone, when they're when it's their turn to do it, they might do 10 bodyweight squats. You'll be amazed how metabolically that will make players just feel it completely different and obviously tougher. Um, and I'm not actually a huge fan of doing push-ups on the field, but I'm just giving you that as an example. I, I think push-ups on the field are overdone, so maybe do something like, uh, if you remember from the Awfully Way video I showed earlier in, in this seminar series, uh, maybe something like a walkout or a push-up rotate. Uh, and the coach simply stands there with a whistle and a watch and really coaches technique. So the player who's shuffling along, you know, and, and it's head wrecking for the players. The first four or five runs, they're thinking this is the easiest conditioning session of all time. Towards the latter end, they're like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> but it, uh, you'll find with tempo runs, the leg stiffness and the soreness that you might get from other forms of training is, isn't a factor because it's done at a high quality. Um, and it just it's just like in a sort of a build up over time. Now, and there's million, millions of different ways you can play around with that. I'm just laying out the basics, I suppose. Um, so that's basically tempo run. So it might look, if you're going to be nerdy on it, that would be something I would have in the background. Um, and if I'm getting really nerdy on it, you might play around with how much recovery you get, how many reps you do, um, and the duration of the session you play around. So we might do something towards what we call the realization phase, where we would do a seven meter shuttle rather than a push up. So we do say seven meter up, seven meter back and go. And then the run is at 70 percent of your pace. And this particular effort, maybe for this team, I said 20 seconds. Um, they get only 40 seconds recovery. That's obviously when they've built up a lot of fitness. And this would be for, a, 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 say, a, I think this particular plan was for a 18, 19-year-old gentleman that was trying to break onto a county team. So this was obviously more advanced. But you could just play around with something like this with your kids, say your 16-year-olds, and say, we're just going to do a few tempos here today, lads, just to get a little bit of fitness in the preseason. Draw back with tempos the time they take. Um, so if you can see there, one of the sessions, last, this is with a senior uh, team now, okay? Um, they take 45 minutes. Um, now, that doesn't mean they're running for 45 minutes, but it's very hard to say do anything else when you're in the zone. Um, so we would have, in, in the past, split it up to tempo at the start, game, tempo in the middle, game, tempo at the end with a senior and county team, for example, or uh, you might only do one block of tempo or with an underage team, say 16, that you feel need a little bit of, of training. Um, you might do this in pre-season to invert commas, build an engine. So again, this is the problem with tempos. They take a long time. Coaches don't like them because they like seeing players running, I suppose, but they don't look that hard. And they take up a lot of time. So, but it's still in information there that you can use and play around with them. And, uh, but they're a nice way to uh, safely condition a team without uh, injuries and stuff like that. You know, well, you never, that's with God, but uh, with different things like that. Is any questions on the tempos? No questions on the tempos, Dave. But there's one going back to the mass runs, a good question after coming in there. Yeah. Um, does mass running cover all the bases of fitness for a GA no. player? No. No. There's a, a continuum, continuation onto that. Will prepare them for repeated sprints or continued 60 meter runs back to the fence and then get forward with very little recovery? Um, probably would prepare them for that a little bit, but uh, I must be uh, kind of clear here. I'm going through a, a lot of different methods to try and if I go back to the metabolic weak link slide from May, these are the different things you will need to kind of be aware of to address all these different issues. So no one thing in conditioning will fix everything in Gaelic football or hurling. That's nearly impossible. I wish it was. Um, so, for example, if you just did sprints, well, uh, you'd be fast and you'd, you'd, you'd be, but maybe in a, in a winter's day when the gale blown in your face, you might lack endurance, should have done more tempos. So it's every, you need a good few tools in your toolbox to fix the metabolic weak links. Does that kind of answer the question? 
and we're actually getting into that now in the next couple of slides. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, perfect. Sounds good, yeah. 100%. Yeah, and then um, we'll go into that now. So speaking of which, one of the other tools that we should have in our toolbox is a lactic conditioning. So this would more or less mean sprinty type stuff. Um, and I love these because they don't take a long time. You can add kind of skill type stuff in there pretty simply. Um, and you can uh, play around with them, like with curved runs, which are so important for Gaelic games. You could throw in um, like they're pulling each other's jersey before they go. You can add the ball. You can take away the ball. They're just quite a handy tool to have. With a lactic conditioning, we're talking about ratios. So what do I mean by that? We'll show you that sort of one slide to kind of give you the, the basics of what way you'd set it up. But um, here would be more specific. So here would be a, a lactic sort of run. 20 meters is what I recommend just for experience. The research would probably say go up to 30 meters. I find when I shift things to 20, 25 meters, little tweaks in the hamstring don't seem to be near as much as an issue when you go up to 30. That's me. You'll know your athletes better than I will. So basically, if you look here, we have three gentlemen lined up behind the yellow cone. We have one gentleman, or that could easily be two gentlemen behind that other cone, and one gentleman in the middle sprinting uh, flat out. So as soon as that gentleman finishes his sprint, the first guy at the yellow cone will sprint. As soon as he finishes his sprint, the guy that's now waiting at the, the pink cone, I think if it's pink on your screen, he goes and so, and so on and so forth. So all you have to do as a coach with this is put down two cones, get the ratios right in terms of where they're at fitness level. So obviously, if there's only two people in the group, that's a viciously hard conditioning session. And obviously, if there's 10 people in the group, that's a pretty darn uh, simple conditioning session. So we have to kind of play around with where our players are at um, and how many minutes we prescribe this for and stuff. So it'll probably end up being like, I don't know, a three and a half, four or five second sprint with maybe three times that as recovery. OK, common question I get is, well, what if I've uneven numbers and I want to do four to one? All you do is you play around with it and you, you do what I call Siamese twin, where you have two players are chunked together and they're one person. And then you can just play around with that. So uh, let's say Jimmy and John become one person for the sake of the drill. And um, this would be good for your short, sharp bursts, your sprint endurance, your speed endurance, if you want to call it like that. And it's a nice tool to have uh, in the toolbox. So that's again back to that question about would this do that and would it, does that cover all the bases? It, now you're getting closer to covering a lot of bases. Um, so you have tempos, you have mass, you have alactic, and you you should now have a much greater appreciation of how to program safely. Um, and you're, you're, you're a long way, <laughs> if you understand this stuff, the kind of conditioning team fairly well, I must say. So uh, just kind of hang in there and ask questions as we go along. And so then how you group them equals basically how hard you, you need to make the session. So something like this, if this is very simple, I just tap this up quickly. There's probably a few mistakes in it. But if you look at, say, week one, um, um, maybe uh, we haven't trained in two weeks and we're little, whatever, I don't know, just the context, I obviously have to put something generic up. But uh, the athletes are in a group of five. Um, so And they're doing five minutes total, right? And then by the time they get to week five, they're in a group of four, which means we've dropped the recovery uh, station, if you will. And then maybe we do skills after that block of seven minutes. And then we repeat uh, something similar or an easier or maybe do a little another uh, hit of three minutes. That would be that would be tough going and you probably wouldn't get up to seven minutes uh, with a team. But it's just an example of how we could step things up, if that makes any sense. You wouldn't. Uh, 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 do a lactic condition with big jumps in time too too much because um, if you go five minutes to six minutes in mass runs that's only like a couple of extra runs but if you go five minutes to six minutes in a lactic condition that's a ton of extra work so you just have to be careful and know the sums and play around with the different um, variables um, so that's another tool in the toolbox 
Does anyone want to ask any questions on, on uh, a lactic setup? Nothing coming in here anyway, Dave. I'd say you can continue on. Okay. I'll let you know if something comes up. No problem. So, um, so that's kind of all the on-pitch stuff. I threw this in just in case because um, it, it, what do we do with the injured player or the player who can't really run yet or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so and this is the great tragedy of this test is you need some form of equipment. I do think um, a great tragedy in the GAA is there's a, a lack of good cardio machinery knocking around nearly every guy club and even in the faithful fields, we've only maybe one or two of these, or maybe only one of the bikes. You can see Noah Mac on there. But they allow you to hit the cardiovascular system, the machinery, without injuring or without fatiguing their legs, if you want to say it like that. That's a huge, uh, that's a great thing for a strength and conditioning coach because it means we can do more. Uh, and it means the player can recover when they catch their breath, say, coming off a bike. They kind of recover fairly quick, okay? Um, so this test is really simple. And this is something, if, if you ever were lucky enough to have one of these bikes, or a, a roam machine would be uh, do the same thing. Anything that has a watt meter on it and will tell you distance. Um, that might be, a, 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 it might be something you do personally in your commercial gym. Uh, where they have loads of cardio machinery, okay? And you simply go five minutes as hard as you can and record the average watts you went at, okay? And from here, we can assign zones. So this is a client I have online, a, a female client with a pretty good training age. Um, she was an ex-sprinter and stuff, but hasn't trained in years. She's a doctor. So... Um, this would be, uh, she did this test for me, her average watts on this particular cardio machine. And another uh, problem with this test is it will only work on this, the same machinery, okay? So you couldn't take these watts and even use a different model of air bike. It would have to be the, um, the same model, etc. But not this, uh, even allowing for that, she averaged 225 watts in those five minutes. And I was able to do is I was just able to play around with when I was giving her homework to do what watts she should do at certain times. So if I wanted her to do um, on, a, on a week, I wanted her to get a real hard sprinty type hit on a Friday. So now I could tell her actually what watts to hit in the sprint. And that's kind of a game changer instead of guessing, you know. So it's like a smart bomb dropping it onto your metabolic system. So you actually know now what way you want to train. And likewise, let's say she's very, very fatigued. And I might say to her, listen, I just want you to do some light cardio today. Uh, I want you to do about 200 watts or so. Keep it easy. Just spin the legs, get that, you know, uh, waste in the leg muscles out of your, your system. Very simple, very easy. And uh, it's something that I wish more GA clubs had. Um, and but even if you, for your own training or even advising your players that are injured um, that do have gym memberships, it might be a nice thing to do. Um, and I should be spending hours on this, but there, we're actually doing one of these webinars on this topic. So it would be silly for me to do it and then for Brendan to do it. But I'll obviously have to go through this. Uh, this is probably, in many ways, the most important slide. For Sorry, me, Dave. go ahead. Quick question on the elactic um, slide there. Could you include the ball in this, in this drill? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's a simple answer. So, and just on this slide here, guys, you see, obviously, that's very linear because it's stick men and I drew it up. You could do curved runs. You could do a uh, slalom where you have two cones where the player has to snake in and around. You could do um, the player, see the three players in the yellow cone. Well, the player behind the first fella is pulling his jersey and he has to break from a tackle. You could have them with the slitter. You can have them with the, with the hurl in their hand. You could do whatever you want. As long as the, 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 the energy system is, is, is being adapted, who cares? Um, but I will say this. Um, 
uh, don't go too mad making it like so, for example i wouldn't do it with um i mightn't do it too cute with skills because then it's neither a brilliant skills drill nor a brilliant conditioning drill does that make sense Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so back to this stuff. Games should be and are the bedrock of any fitness in Gaelic games. All the stuff I went through should be viewed as top-ups. You're getting lots of touches, lots of engagement, lots of balls, have lots of fun. Um, and you can still elicit a whole lot of these uh, conditioning benefits with a simple thing like a very smart 5v5, 4v4 and just play around with the rules so it could be as simple and you guys are better at this than I am um, so you, you know your basic template could be let's say if, you know uh, even a 7v7 or something 6v6 and then you want one team to work harder 6v4, put rules in the game where if you can see three scores in a row you do uh, a mass run um, and that will get a bit of intensity into the game. Um, you know, play around with it. Psychologically, play around with it. And then remember the step principle, just how many players. Obviously, if we have a tiny grid with 12 players in it, well, no one's really running or doing it. Now, you'll get a lot of collisions and a lot of strength work, maybe. And, and that's an art form in itself. And um, I have, and I forgot to put it up on this, uh, someone who's smarter than me worked out um, how big your grid should be for how many players are in them in football. Now, Michael, you might know if there's something exists in Hurling for that, does it? There is actually, yeah, no, I can't think of the place, the man that actually done it, but there is that somewhere. Yeah, um, now, if I try I'll be and honest, find it, get it sent out an email or something. Yeah, you, you're, you're like me, you just use me eye and I... Yeah. I yeah, I just, even in the middle of a drill, I just, you know, either pull the cones in or pull the cones out as on the fly. I wouldn't be there with a trundle wheel measuring out a square. But it is nice to know just that someone's, someone who's nerdier than me has worked it out. Um, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, uh, so let's say a really tough tackling square, not a normal tackling square, and two minutes on, one minute off, that's just a game-specific interval. That's all it is. Um on top of getting a lot of skill work in with the players, um, which is always a good thing, uh, especially with the underage, this is where it's at. And I recommend everyone go onto that webinar about fitness with the ball, okay? Um, I will say this, there is some people out there who espouse do nothing but fitness with the ball. And I think that's probably misguided too, um, because you do most of your hard running in Gaelic games without the ball. Um, so I would still have a little bit of without the ball stuff, even for the purists who do nothing but fitness work with the ball. But certainly that's where it's at. Um, and uh, again, like I suppose my first seminar, which is where I said, uh, warning, this is not to get in the way of good skills on hurling and football. Well, warning, the stuff I went through is not to get in the way of just brilliant game-based coaching and play around. It's amazing how you can elicit wider different rules and just get them really out of their comfort zone fitness wise um so like here's a kind of sample session i said i throw up um really simple so i might get a team together i might do a warm-up as per last webinar so we're hitting all our speed and we're doing all that stuff at the end of the webinar our injury prevention protocols i might do say a drill if this is football now just for a second so Drill, I might do the two ball drills with a 30 meter run involved. And it is a bit of running in it, but it's low level. So that might tick our sort of endurance box a little bit as well. If I'm kind of thinking fitness wise there, then I'm straight into a game, uh, depending on numbers and how many coaches I have 4v4s, 5v5s, 6v4s, 7v3s, whatever you want to do. I just think uh, just, you know, any drill would, you know, uh, even a, what's the old expression, a drill with a goal at the end is, is a game anyway so the, the 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 possibilities there are endless and again um you know yourself you want quality in that game so you might go three minutes on uh one minute off and be strict on yourself about that because then players buy in more i think then you might do a little bit of your effect or mass runs as we say four five six minutes depending on how fit they are and then a game at the end it's a pretty good session um pretty good session for an under 15 team You'll notice that it's not an S&C session, 
but we're certainly developing cardiovascular fitness in all the different areas with that team. So bear in mind, in this session, we'd have done the warm up by like touches earlier, which includes speed and plyometrics and different things like that as well. And if anyone missed that, we have that recorded. So just uh, leave your email at the end and we'll send that to you or, or email us at the end. Um, and then what about an overall uh, week, let's say? Um, let's say uh, the same team. I trained them three nights a week. Probably a lot of you in the call say, no way would I get them three nights a week. But I'm just giving you four example. Uh, Wednesday might be normal training. And then inverted commas, your fitness stuff might be six minutes of mass runs as a top up. Maybe two blocks of six minutes depending, of course, on the 10% rule of your team at that particular time. On Friday, maybe it might be a uh, normal training, inverted commas, normal training, um, and then some alactic style uh, uh, sprint or sp repeat sprint endurance type stuff, if you want to call it that, um, to hit that sort of adaptation we're looking for with our players. And then on Sunday, just all games, game-based, maybe even a, a match if it's not that an important game. And you can play around with that. Obviously, you might train Monday, you might train, but that's kind of where we're at, okay? And then if you're really in the senior level, um, to be honest with you, even with inter-county level, it probably would look roughly the same, just um, they'd be doing a bit more, they'd be doing it a bit harder, and they'd probably be training more. So, um, you know, and Michael can tell you about that. He's on the hurling team there. So, you know, it'll be different. But the overall principles will be the same. Um, that's not to say you couldn't do nothing but mass runs for six weeks. There would, And if you can justify that, that's fine. But I would say you're probably smarter and better is to have a little bit of everything in your program as you go through your journey. Um, and not to worry about it too much, to be honest with you, with an underage team. But certainly when they get... Uh, listen, there's no harm training the kid to be fit, is there? So um, that's just kind of a, a few little government health warnings there on that. Um, so just let's go through a recap. So let's try and fit it all in together. 10% um, rule key. Think of the minimal effective dose. The game should be the central focus. And if you're not savvy with games based and how to make them sort of more fitness orientated, um, just go on the GA uh, learning website. Michael, what's that one again? The e-learning website, isn't it? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. And um, just phenomenal games on that. I would say view this stuff as top-ups, your Gaelic football and hurling coaches. The fitness stuff is secondary, okay? They aren't uh, an athletics club. So I'd always remember that, which most, most people obviously do. And everyone is different. And that's sort of the, I've been very generic here. Um, some people will need engines. Some people will need speedy stuff. And over time, you'll get to know your players and you might be able to manipulate it to give them different things. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, you won't always win. But if you went through what I've went through before, you'll, uh, the, the, the plan could be better. There's some uh, more scientific stuff that I could go into. But it's a really good start if we could get our clubs and awfully starting to think along, that, uh, along those lines. So if I have any questions at all, don't be shy. Hopefully it didn't bore you to death there too much because it is a sort of sciencey subject. And I can go back on slides and go forward if, if anyone's still awake. And don't be afraid to unmute your mic. <laughs> no questions? No, I don't think there's any coming in. All right. I'll take that as a compliment, so many wouldn't. Um, so... I think this is recorded, so I have all your emails, and we will send this out if anyone missed it or whatever. I would like you to ask a question now if you did, so everyone could avail of of the knowledge. But if you do, and you kind of you're having your cup of tea after this, and you suddenly forgot to ask something, just send me an email, and if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, and I'll try and find the answer for you. Okay. David, just one for me before you go. Would those sort of running techniques be applicable for referees as well for their fitness? Um, why not? You're playing the game, but you're just not touching the ball. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and uh, from I actually have trained the refs a few times, um, and with the Leinster referees, Emmett Egan kind of, and it's pretty much the same thing to be honest. Okay. 
Um, but I would say the referees, uh, probably if some of them are starting off and their fitness base is low, they could probably ignore a lot of this and just start doing maybe some basic endurance style training and build the base and build an engine. Um, but certainly the referee that's in the system and, and needs a few kind of more sophisticated things, definitely think uh, I would still give it roughly the same information. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay, guys, we'll wrap it up. So unless there's any questions, um, thanks very much for uh, logging in. Uh, I know it's tricky and uh, hopefully you got one or two little p things from that and uh, happy hunting with your own teams and your own training. Okay. Thanks very much, David. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.